Charts. I am your host, Jake Uger. It's Monday, so we got a packed show for you guys. We'll never get to everything on time. I got to go. So, A, uh, later in the show, Dick Cheney says that uh, President Obama should apologize to him. That's interesting. Uh, B, uh, Rick Perry used to hunt on a ranch called, and I'm saying this within the context of the story. We'll say it again, unfortunately. Niggerland. What? <laughs> Okay, I was wondering why Jr. grabbed the mic. That's why he turned and looked. I was like, what's he going to say? I don't feel very comfortable working here anymore. Is, is that right? <laughs> At least we didn't paint a giant rock with that title and say, welcome to... Okay, we will explain that later in the program. Uh, and also, of course, uh, Occupy Wall Street has now expanded. Uh, there were mass arrests, but also uh, we had Occupy LA here, and we sent our special TYT special correspondent, uh, Anna Kasparian. And she'll be joining us in the third segment to talk about her experience there. And we've got video. We've got video. All right, that's all coming up in the show. But first segment, first piece of news is obvious. Uh, it is the Koch brothers story. Now, uh, if you ha haven't heard of this, at least uh, in some ways, what you've been doing, living in a box? There's an old friend of mine in Philadelphia who once asked me when I asked him the Eagles score. Okay, so <laughs> uh, let's do it. Now, this story is huge. Uh, Bloomberg deserves a world of credit, uh, the news organization does, for breaking it down. Uh, there are a great number of uh, problems with Coke Industries that they have outlined. Let me quickly run down for you the list of problems, and then I will explain them in order. So, uh, they have uh, bribed foreign countries uh, to win contracts, which is a violation of U.S. law. They have done toxic waste dumping, another violation of U.S. law. Uh, they have done price fixing, another violation of U.S. law. We will explain all these in detail. Uh, also, a little thing called an uncontrolled uh, emissions of benzene, which is disastrous. Uh, that's, as you can tell, this is getting worse and worse. Uh, another thing that Coke Industries has done is... Uh, worked with Iran, they have made sales to Iran, another violation of U.S. law, and then um, we're getting to the two worst ones, you're thinking it's worse than uncontrolled emissions of benzene and working with Iran, well, so, something we've called a terrorist state, yes, uh, they've ripped off American taxpayers on purpose, stolen from us, another violation of U.S. law, a lot of these they've already agreed to and paid fines for and apologized for as they continue to make money. The benzene story is a perfect example. I'll get to that in a minute. And finally, um, leaks in their pipelines that, have, that they were fully aware of that led to the death of two teenagers. And they paid a, a huge fine on that as well. Uh, we will explain what they knew. I was going to say and didn't know, but they knew it all. Uh, and uh, let's get started. Let's take them one by one. So, uh, Bloomberg story on the Koch brothers. Uh, first gives you an insight into the bribes that they paid to different countries and different officials to win over contracts. They did it through their subsidiary in France called Coke Glish, uh, and sometimes they would uh, do this uh, on a regular basis where they would do the, this kind of dirty work through their subsidiaries and then go, what, what, what? We didn't do it in the U.S. Our, you know, a branch of our company that happened to be in France is the one that did it. What can you do? Uh, they had hired this woman named Ludmila Agorova Fereness uh, to be a compliance officer. Why? Because a German company had just paid a huge fine for doing the same thing. So they said, oh, look, we're going to comply and everything's going to be fine. And uh, they brought her in and she said, quote, I uncovered the practices within a few days. They were not hidden at all. It turns out they were doing the same exact thing. Now, you're going to be shocked to find out that when she reported that, later they decided to fire her. Wow, we didn't see that coming. And um, so, uh, let me tell you some of the things that uh, they admitted to, Coke, Coke Industries, uh, in a letter that they wrote to the court in December 8th of 2008, when acknowledging that they had done this stuff, said, quote, those activities constitute violations of criminal law. Well... There you go. Nonetheless, they removed uh, Fairness from her position in August of 2008 and fired her in June of 2009. And um, so who are the people that they tried to bribe? Officials in Algeria, Egypt, India, Morocco, Nigeria, and Saudi Arabia from a period between 2002 and 2008. They blamed it at some point on an official uh, named Mr. Mausen who worked for them. 
uh, but uh, the court decided in 2010, it, quote, it was not Mr. Mousen alone who was given authorizations. It turns out it was high-ranking corporate officers and directors who were giving authorizations to bribe foreign officials. So um, there you have it. That's point number one. They were bribing foreign officials, which, again, is a clear violation of the law. Uh, in fact, they even admitted themselves in uh, court papers. So point number two in the Bloomberg story on Coke Industries, toxic waste dumping. How's that for fun? Well, uh, there's an earlier case all the way back from, um, let me see, uh, one quick thing here. It's a 17-page story. I knew that, that we were going to run into issues, right? <laughs> and I've gotten some order here. Okay, let me, let me do it this way. Okay. There's a quote here, and it's, you'll find this amusing as we stumble here. Uh, there's a quote about how uh, the executives at Coke Industries, uh, 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 the officers, directors, managers, and employees participated in the conspiracy. But there were so many conspiracies in the story. In this particular quote, I lost track of which conspiracy they were committing. Okay, so we'll get back to that part in a second. So, uh, toxic waste dumping uh, was the second part of the Bloomberg story on the Koch brothers. Um, they were supposed to pay up 15% uh, of the cleanup costs for a dumping on a site that happened between 1946 and 1953. Now, look, that's a long time ago. So you think, all right, I, at least I thought, well, look, I'm, I'm not putting ahead of Charles and David Koch's footsteps. They obviously weren't running the company at that time. But how does it relate to now? Well, it's 2007 at the time, and Conoco has to sue Koch brothers because they refuse to pay their share. They're supposed to pay their share because they were the ones who did the dumping, and they won't pay it. They still owed uh, about $3 million. But they just hate paying fines, and they didn't want to do it when finally, when Conoco and another company took them to court, they're like, oh, all right, fine, we did the toxic dumping. Uh, we'll pay um, some portion of it. Uh, but th that's not all in terms of uh, how far back this goes. Uh, in uh, 1999, a Coke unit in Rosemount, Minnesota, pled guilty, pled guilty to two federal mes misdemeanors for violating the C Clean Water Act, and they paid $8 million in fines and penalties. Why? The company used fire hydrants to pump and dump more than a million gallons of wastewater contaminated with ammonia onto the ground. Yeah, where are we going to put this ammonia? It's a pain in the ass. Let's just dump it into the ground, and if the people in Minnesota around here get sick, not our problem, that's their problem. Oops, we got caught. Well, golly gee willikers. Look, look at all the things that they get caught on. Now, imagine all the things they don't get caught on, because these are the things that were discovered and they paid a fine for, and they thought it made economic sense to keep getting caught and keep paying these fines because of all the things that they probably aren't getting caught on. That one was for $8 million. So, now, uh, we go to... Point number three. Point number three in the Bloomberg story on uh, the Koch brothers and all their <laughs> illegal and uh, violations and, and also uh, fines they had to pay is price fixing. So what did they do in terms of price fixing? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> in November of 2010, Coach Glitch and Monts, uh, which is a company that they were working with, each paid 250,000 euro fine as part of a settlement with the regulators for sharing information between December of 2002 and August of 2008. Now, what was the information that they shared? Well, they would get together and go, all right, here's my prices, here's your prices, let's fix the prices so neither one of us has to bother competing. Now, this I love, and it's a great irony because the Koch brothers always talk about the free market. Oh, the free market will solve everything. We'll just have competition and it's totally fine. Except the reality is like, screw the free market. Let's collude, make sure there is no competition so you and I can both make more money. Uh, well, there was a guy named uh, Troy Stanley Sr. He was the director of the textile uh, staples company COSA that they had bought. And it was a joint venture in 1998 that they did with uh, a Mexican company actually. And he was uh, indicted uh, on these charges and eventually convicted. So let me tell you if I can find the page number. This is a mess. <laughs> you have wandered into a mess, folks. <laughs> you know, oh, here we go. 
Stanley pled guilty to one count of conspiring to restrain trade in December of 2004 and was sentenced to one year of probation and a $5,000 fine. I tell you that so you know that this is not just, you know, oh, a little fine here, a little fine there. It was criminal, okay? And so yet another violation of the law, yet again done to make more money, yet again with absolutely no regard to the free market. They just, by any means necessary, want to make more money. All right. Point number four in the Bloomberg story on the Koch brothers and their illegal actions. Uncontrolled emissions of benzene. Now this is a dandy. So Sally uh, barnes Solis was hired as an investigator uh, to find out, hey, uh, how are we doing in terms of the emissions that we are putting into there? Because look, they've got to comply uh, with government standards on this because if you don't, people get sick. Uh, benzene is an absolutely proven uh, cause of cancer. Okay, there's no absolutely no question about that. Uh, and uh, it turns out that she did find out that they were had issues with uh, benzene emissions. Uh, she said, first of all, the refinery, refinery was just hemorrhaging benzene into the atmosphere. Hemorrhaging benzene is not a good idea. She uh, winds up telling the regulators, because when she told her bosses and said, hey, we have to report this, they said, yeah, I don't think so. I think we're going to report something else. In fact, uh, let me tell you uh, what uh, the reality was and what they reported. They could only do six metric tons of uncontrolled benzene emissions. So it's not like you can't do any uh, emissions. Regulators are reasonable. They understand you're going to have a certain amount. They're just trying to figure out what the safe amount is. So they've decided that six uh, metric tons of uh, benzene, which is, you know, again, it, scientists have determined is a, is a decent amount, but not uh, uh, one that will cause cancer to everyone in the uh, area, whether it's workers or the citizens. Well, guess how much uh, the Koch brothers uh, companies did? Turns out they had 91 metric tons of uncontrolled benzene emissions, which was 15 times higher uh, than what the rules allowed for. So now this is a significant problem. So what did they report to the government instead? They said it was 0.61 metric tons, uh, which was in reality about one 149th of the amount of emissions they were actually emitting into the air. So a gigantic amount of benzene is put into the air when they shouldn't. Uh, how do we know benzene causes cancer? Well, because there's been numerous studies that showed, for example, in these kind of emissions cases, people working around those emissions wound up getting cancer within five years at a significant rate. Okay, now it's not just the workers, it's also the uh, nearby areas. In fact, Solis talks about how she got into the business because she wanted to make sure that everybody was safe. She wanted to make sure, she was proud of what she did. That's one of her quotes where she explains, look, I didn't want people uh, working in those factories to get sick, I wanted to protect the community. And when that's part of the reason she also reported it to uh, the higher ups at Coke Industries. And here's what uh, their, their reaction was according to her. She says, quote, they didn't know what to do with me they were really kind of baffled that I had ethics. <laughs> in 2001, Coke uh, refinery unit responsible for those benzene emissions pled guilty to federal felony charges of lying to regulators and paid $20 million in fines and penalties. So again, this is not disputed, it is absolutely proven. Now, here's the important part. I think the benzene story is amazing because of what it shows. It turns out that they could have actually ref, uh, controlled the benzene emissions and been within the law and not harmed anybody if they spent $7 million. Now eventually they get fined $20 million, but they think that's worth it because of all the years that they are putting that uh, emissions into the air, which they didn't have to pay for, plus they figure we got caught on this, but we don't get caught on all the other things we cheat on. Overall, it uh, ec makes economic sense for us to continue doing this. But you know, a lot of times, Conservatives or Republicans will say, oh no, but wait a minute, that's not fair. Um, you know, this overdue, uh, overburdensome regulations, and you're gonna put these companies out of work, and the next thing you know, there's not gonna be any jobs. Well, is that true? Well, not exactly. It turns out that Coke earned $176 million in profits from that Corpus Christi plant in 1995 alone. So all they had to do was earn $169 million in profit from that plant, and everybody would have been safe. But just to squeeze an extra nickel out of it, 
even though it costs the economy and it costs the workers there and, their, and the citizens of Corpus Christi more money, they didn't care. They did it anyway. Again, all proven, they pled guilty. They do this all the time. So they would have made just a tiny little less profit and kept their workers safe in the area safe, and they didn't want to do it. Did their workers get, you know, cancer? Who cares, man? Charles and David Koch saved a couple of bucks. Isn't that awesome? Okay, all of this is bad. It gets worse. Point, <laughs> here we go. Point number five of the illegal actions uh, that is documented by Bloomberg against the Koch brothers is dealings with Iran. In 1995, Iran was put on a list of terrorist states uh, that it was uh, decided was against our national security interest to do business with. Well, Coke Industries didn't have an interest in that, uh, in complying with that law. They wanted to make that money anyway. So what did they do? The usual trick where they uh, had a subsidiary do those same transactions and then go, what? <laughs> it wasn't us. It was our crazy subsidiary in Europe. In fact, you know that this is the case because here is one internal email. It says, if somebody happens to find out that any U.S. persons are involved in this project or U.S. material is delivered to Iran, you cannot quote, cannot is, is in bold, okay, and is uh, enlarging. In other words, we know what we're doing is illegal. That's why you cannot quote this under any circumstances because then we'll get caught. It's an internal email. They know. So, um, well, it turns out that... Uh, uh, a guy by the name of George Bentu, who worked in that subsidiary from 2001 to 2007, who was a sales engineer. Uh, what, of course, they, they want to sell the products. He wants to sell the products, keep employed. Sees that they're selling it to Iran. He goes, but wait a minute. Now, this I'm uncomfortable with because we know this is a clear violation of law. Reports it to his uh, superiors. Come to find out that they don't give a damn. <laughs> of course. Here's what Bentu said. Quote, every single chance they had to do business with Iran or anyone else, they did, okay? Um, now, again, uh, we're not surprised by that, um, but apparently Bentu was. Hold on, let me see if I have any more Bentu quotes because this stuff was good. Mm. Damn it, I knew there was another good Bentu quote somewhere. Hold, hold, hold one second. Oh yeah, here we go. It's amazing I keep this in mind. All right, here we go. When Bentu found out that uh, it turns out the Coke executives weren't going to do a damn thing about it, they knew that they were uh, selling to Iran and that they weren't going to stop because they were kept making money, he said, quote, you feel totally betrayed. Everything Coke stood for was a lie. Now, because, you, know what, you want to know why he says that? Because Coke Industries internally and externally tells everyone that, quote, integrity is their number one value. <laughs> That's a good one. Integrity. So when Bentu has integrity and he tells the superiors we shouldn't be doing something illegal, they're like, what are you, stupid? We're making an extra buck off of it. So what do they do, by the way? The company's products help to build a methanol plant uh, for Zagros Petrochemical uh, Company, Iran's state-owned national Iranian petrochemical company, uh, is uh, the parent company there, and they would use the natural gas that Iran had in order to uh, produce a great number of different products, and uh, and Iran made money, the Koch brothers made money, everybody was happy except for the fact that it was a gross violation of the law. Okay, come on, it can't keep getting worse than this, right? Point number six on the Bloomberg story on the Koch industries uh, and their clear violations of the law is uh, stealing from the American taxpayers. By the way, you want to know who turned them in on this one? Their brother did. David Koch has a twin brother, uh, Bill Koch, and they, he split with the company uh, early on in the 1980s. And he turned them in because he said they were stealing from American taxpayers. They knew they were doing it. In fact, internally, they called this theft, quote, the Koch method. And so he turned them into the authorities, and we found out about all this. And eventually they admitted it and uh, paid a fine. So what did they do? As they were taking uh, crude oil from Native American lands, which they had to pay royalties to the American taxpayers for, they would purposely uh, count it wrong. So they would get, as an example, 
they'd get 10 barrels and they'd go, oh, look at that interesting seven barrels of oil we got out of the ground. And they had a hundred different ways of, uh, of measuring it wrong on purpose, which federal regulators found out about, documented, and again, proved. Um, so uh, we always find out from the, their own employees all the things that they did wrong. In this case, Phil DeBose was uh, someone who worked for Coke Industries from 1968 to 1994. So he'd been there a long time. He was obviously hesitant to talk about this, but eventually in a court of law said, quote, the Coke method is to cheat the producer out of crude oil. They stole 2,000 barrels a month from one customer alone. Overall, they stole 1.95 million barrels of oil that they did not pay for from 86 to 88. Uh, and DuBois also said, quote, you used every available tool to mismeasure the crude oil in Coke's favor. And in 1999, uh, there was a jury verdict that they had filed 24,587 false claims in buying oil and underpaying the United States government, the royalties that they were owed from actually from 85 to 89, and they wound up uh, paying a $25 million fine. Again, probably a fraction of what they stole, uh, but that's the way they do business. Now, why do these guys not want regulations? As you see all of these things, it becomes obvious. They don't want the regulations because regulators are the cops and they're the robbers. If you're going to steal crude oil from the American people, you want cops looking over your shoulder? Of course you don't. That's why the Koch brothers have given over $50 million to politics. And that's a lowball estimate of, of, one, of money we know they gave. There's, it could be that they've given a lot more than that, and they plan on giving a lot more than that in the next election. Why do they give all that money? So that they tell the politicians, stop the regulation. We don't want, quote unquote, big government interfering with the free market. The reason they don't want those regulations is because those are the guys who keep them honest. If you don't have the regulators, they get to steal more crude oil, they get to leak more benzene, they get to do more illegal deals with Iran, they get to bribe foreign officials. Regulators are a pain, they're the cops. Why would the robbers want the cops around? Again, all these cases are proven, and they paid fines in all of these. But now we get to the worst one. So, how could it be worse than all this? Well, point number seven in the Bloomberg story on Coke Industries and their illegal acts is the most devastating one. It is about leaks that came from their facilities uh, and their pipelines that they had been warned about. Uh, Coke Pipeline Company um, had a Texas pipeline uh, that the National Transportation Safety Board concluded in 1998 had leaks and they told them over and over again, it is not safe. Please, you have to get this uh, under uh, control. In fact, and uh, Edward Ziegler, who used to work for Coke Industries uh, on another case, testified against them in this particular case, saying it was the worst negligence in regards to safety that he had seen in his 25-year career. So, um, well, what happened? Uh, Coke settled, um, oh, I'm sorry, that's the conclusion of the story. So, uh, what happened overall? Well, you've got this pipeline, it's leaking. They've been told over and over that it leaks and it's a safety problem. Well, they never fixed it. And because fixing it would have cost a couple of bucks. Two teenagers are in the area, they smell gas, they're trying to get out of there, their truck, uh, uh, stalls right by the gas. When they uh, turn on the car again, uh, it catches on fire and it burns them to death. Now, look, the leak was terrible and disastrous in the first place because it had this, you know, the dangerous chemicals that it was putting into the air. It was making the area sick to begin with. They'd been warned over and over again they don't do anything about it. But it's also dangerous because it can catch on fire and literally cause explosions as it did. Two kids, dead. A jury uh, found uh, the Koch brothers' uh, companies were responsible, and they uh, imposed a $296 million fine in a verdict in 1999. The company then eventually settled out of court for an undisclosed amount. Uh, well, after that, uh, they finally settled with the EPA, a case that, that had been going on for five years, uh, in fact, two different cases. They paid another $35 million to resolve those fines. But if you had resolved it before the kid's car caught on fire and they died, they'd be alive today. 
but that's what they do. They don't resolve any of these. They know that they have these dangerous conditions and they continue to do it anyway because they want to make an extra buck. That's why they want the government out of their hair. Wouldn't it be great if the government never got involved and they were never held responsible for the deaths of those kids? They would have saved over $300 million. Oh, they got caught on this one. Doesn't that suck for them? Okay, did they learn their lesson? The guy who was responsible for that pipeline, this guy by the name of Caffey, uh, that year, you might imagine, after costing the company all this money and doing all this, might be fired, right? Nope. They doubled his bonus. That year, even though they knew that that accident happened, they paid him a $900,000 bonus for a job well done. By the way, if you're not getting why they did that, it's so that he stays quiet. You think that he didn't take orders from above? Yeah, just keep making the money. Don't worry about the fixes. Don't worry about safety. Just keep doing what you're doing. Oh, by the way, congratulations for covering up for us. Here's $900,000 bonus for a job well done. That's how Coke Industries works. And sometimes people get sick, sometimes people die, sometimes the law is broken, but who cares? Coke Industries continues to make another buck. That's why they don't want the government regulating anything, because they're the robbers, and the government's the cops, and the robbers don't like the cops. And, well, they found, like all those, you know, gangsters and criminals of the past, they have found uh, a way to get around the cops, which is... You buy the people that the cops report to. In this case, it's the politicians. And they have so thoroughly bought our system now that those Republican politicians and a lot of times Democratic politicians are working to make sure that they take those cops off the beat, that they uh, lessen regulation so that in the words of the Republican leadership, that businesses will have more certainty. Certainty that they can cheat, certain they can break the law, and certainty that they can get away with it. It's a brilliant piece of reporting from Bloomberg. I had to share all of it with you. Now you know. We'll come right back. All right, back on the Young Turks. I can't help it. One last thing on Occupy Wall Street. So everybody, we've already talked about how, you know, if these were Tea Party protests, they'd be covered uh, to no end. Like, you know, during the break, Steve was talking about, Anna was talking about two different instances of commentators being dismissive. Like, oh, it's only 2,000 people. If you had 2,000 tea, protests, tea party protesters anywhere, the... The me mainstream media would lose it in their pants. They'd be like, oh, 2,000 <laughs> protesters! Oh, it was gigantic! It was the largest thing we've ever seen. So now we already know that. Here's what I want to add to it. Think about why they like the tea party so much, why they encourage that, why they're fascinated by that story, and why they don't treat it with the same disdain that they do for Occupy Wall Street. You know what I'm saying? Yes. People don't come on and go, oh, they might hate the Tea Party, some commentators, liberals, whatever, right? And they might say it's bad or whatever, but they don't, nobody ever comes out and goes, oh, I dismiss the Tea Party. They're so irrelevant. They only brought 24 people or 200 people to a protest. They never do well, that. Because the Tea Party is a mouthpiece for what the establishment wants, right? Exactly. And, and the with, reason they treat it with respect is because the Tea Party ultimately wants the same thing as the system wants, right? They think they don't, and I think a lot of people genuinely within the Tea Party think like that they're fighting the system, but they have been so grossly misdirected that they're in fact encouraging the system. Yes. That's why the media is like, good, good boy, Tea Party, good boy. Oh, you Occupy Wall Street ruffians. A bunch of kids in a romper room. Get out of here. Yeah. Get, get. In that, you see, that's in, the difference. In uh, the rest of that video that we did on Occupy LA, uh, the, one of the organizers said, you know, when it comes to the Tea Partiers, it's super ironic because you have people that are in the exact same position as the Occupy LA protesters, right? They're middle class or they're working class, they're poor, yet they're out there and they're angry and they don't know what, what to do about it and they're calling for more tax cuts. <laughs> they want less government. They want less help. Well, okay, if you want more tax cuts, do you understand like not having the top 1% pay their fair share of taxes is directly harming you? They don't know that. They're so misdirected. But yet the media never treats them with disdain. Right. Again, some in the media don't like them, but not with disdain. They don't say like, oh, these fools, they don't know what to ask for. In fact, the Tea Party originally was designed to fight against the bailouts. 
They have never fought against the bailouts. Never. They never fought against, they're the ones that should be occupying Wall Street, right? But has the media ever said, oh, the party, a bunch of people that don't know what they want. <laughs> so why did they never fight? They're so confused. They never even fought, fought against the bailouts. No, shh, nobody ever points that out. I thought when I first pointed that out, that everybody was gonna follow suit and then they were gonna say, ah, they weren't gonna give me credit for being first, right? I love that, right? <laughs> okay, turns out, no, nobody follows suit. <laughs> I can get all the credit I like for being first. I'm still the only one who points out the Tea Party was for the bailouts, yet they never protested Wall Street because they got misdirected. Uh, what, 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 yeah, got, and the rich are awesome! What, why do we just say that? And, and also keep in mind, they get a lot of credibility because they have backing from billionaires like the Koch brothers, right? right? The Koch brothers help organize these protests. They fund the bus rides. They fund, you know, the organizers and the leaders who get people together and mobilize the people. So they get a lot. The media will legitimize them till no end. All right. Last thing on this. Look, uh, I both want to be fair and in some ways unfair to Mark Meckler, who I talked to at, at that conference in Boston. He's the head of the Tea Party Patriots. I want to be fair in that I want you to understand not every Tea Party group takes money from the Koch brothers, and they don't take money. The Patriots don't, right? And I think that it keeps them more intellectually honest. That's the part where it's just keeping it real, okay? Mm -hmm. And they get uh, annoyed when the Koch brothers show up in a bus and almost take credit for something that they have done organically, right? So th that's part of, like, I know that some of them genuinely believe it, right? Having said that, at the same time, I asked Mark, I said, so you guys were originally because of the bailouts. He's like, yeah. I'm like, so what protests did you do on Wall Street? None, <laughs> okay. And I said, Mark, what happened? Because I believe the guy. I believe that he genuinely is upset and all these other people that he's organizing are upset and they're not taking Coke money, et cetera, et cetera. He's like, I don't know. There were just so many things that came up. We just never had a chance. <laughs> well, I wonder why they came up. You know, I wonder how you got directed that way and you lost track of what you were supposed to be originally doing, you know? So anyway, you guys, uh, okay, so one last, okay, one announcement here before we go on to the stories, if we ever do. Uh, okay, sorry. Um, so uh, I wanted to thank you guys because about.me uh, is, they, what they do is they like virtual business cards basically. Yes. Was doing a contest to get, to put people on a billboard. And you know, we always try to promote the show in every different way. And our uh, uh, listeners, viewers, uh, on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, etc., all those people wound up voting, and guess what? TYT Army is too strong, as usual. We won. So, uh, my uh, ugly mug's gonna be on a billboard in Times Square um, uh, starting October 8th, which is awesome. It's awesome not because my face is there, but because it's gonna give a lot more promotion to the show, which is right. fantastic. Uh, it's on 47th and Broadway, and what they do is they rotate the winners, right? right? So if you go there and you don't see us, don't panic, okay? Just wait a little bit and it's recurring and you will see it. If you guys can, apparently it's a 30 second spot that runs about eight to 12 times per hour. If you can take a picture of it and send it to us, that would be great because we're not in New York, but I know a lot of you are, mm -hmm. and we'd love to get those and, and show them on the show. And again, thanks guys, I really appreciate it. It helps the show tremendously. Don't you think the billboard needs a little aesthetic balance? Maybe include me on there? <laughs> the problem is that about.me is like a business card, like so yeah. it shows you a little. I'm just joking around. So no, no, it would be much better if we actually showed the picture of all of us. That's a ten times cooler picture. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, it's per person. Maybe we should have just done you. That would have been ten times That'd better. That'd be ridiculous. But <laughs> okay. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it certainly would have captured more attention. Uh, now we move forward. All right. The ladies of the View were discussing Rick Perry's uh, hunting camp, and of course, uh, the. You know. The N word came up because yes. it's in it. Yes, yes I know. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so um, the ladies of you were discussing it, and they also talked about Herman Cain's use of the N word. Mm -hmm. Now, while they were having the, dis uh, d the discussion, things got a little tense because Barbara Walters said the word nigger. Uh -huh. Okay? Oh, boy. Let's watch the video. ...club on a property that was named... Okay, yes. now, and when the candidate, Herman Cain, talked about it, how radically insensitive it was yesterday. He didn't use the term N-word, which I guess is what we're supposed to be saying now. It's so hard to know what, what to say now. So I just used the word, But okay? you know, I find that so interesting that you did. Because when Herman Cain said this yesterday, mm -hmm. he was on with uh, Christian Amanpour, and he said, it's very hard for he me to say, and we never say it here. 
the, na the name of this camp that Rick Perry's father leased, there was a sign mm -hmm. that said... On a rock. Okay, right. that's so the difference so between what you and Whoopi say it. That's okay. why... Okay, so from that video, you can tell that uh, Sherry Shepard did not like the fact that Barbara Walters didn't just say N-word, she actually said the word completely, right? Mm -hmm. Now, Sherry Shepard explains why she's upset about it in the next video. Let's right. watch. And then we'll regulate. I feel differently from Whoopi, because, I mean, and I'm not saying how you feel. When I heard you say it, mm -hmm. it was fine. You, you said it a different way. When I heard you say it, I didn't like the way you said it, because when you say it, you say N I. And I don't like her. You didn't. Say her. It's just. It's, I'm sorry. I'm not sure. I know. I know. It's, a, I know it's a semantics thing, but it's something that goes through my body. It's not just to me. It's it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, uh, forgive me if I didn't say it exactly the same it's way. A, even even if you didn't, you wouldn't have said it the right way. I mean, it, and it's nothing on you, Barbara. That's what I'm saying. It's nothing on you. It's because I'm white that I shouldn't use the yeah, word. Yeah, it's something about I, hearing you say it that so that no just. white person should use that word. You know, I feel differently from from other people. I don't like it when you use the word. Now, I have used it with my friends, with my family. I don't say it like you. So it, it's a when you say it, it's a different connotation. It, it, I'm it's not something. Sure I understand why. I know you probably would, and I probably could never explain the, the way I, I feel. I mean, I'm repeating yeah. what was on the rock. Any white person. Yeah. All right. Uh, I, I am ready for an immediate ruling. Uh, totally, utterly disagree with Sherry Shepard. Yes, I agree. Because she used that word in the context of a news story. She didn't say, I think this person is an N-word, or I, I think the N-word is okay. She just said, look, uh, th this is Rick Perry's father's uh, hunting camp, and it said, you know, whatever, niggerhead. And of course, Sherry Shepard didn't like that, but it's in the context of a news story. Yeah, no question about it. Uh, look, uh, I, this is really important for people to understand, because a lot of times people, uh, white folks say, oh, you know, it's just all politically correct. Uh, not to say the word, you're wrong. The word is toxic, and it's toxic because it was used against people. It was used to demean people and to keep them down for decades on on, and, and, and even longer. And there's a reason why the word is toxic. On the other hand, it is politically incorrect to say that you can't, a white person or a non-black person could never say the word, even within the context of a news story about the word. That makes no sense. That takes it from, you know, from being a logical, hey, let's not use this toxic word, to totally irrational, just avoid the word, even though you have to say it in the context of the story. Yeah. Anna said it in the context of the story. When I covered the Rick Perry story in the first hour, I said it in the context of the story. Because you don't know what the ranch is unless you tell people. I mean, what are we supposed to say? Every time called the N-word head? Yeah, it's <laughs> a little crazy. ridiculous. That's crazy. But I'll go one step further. Sherry Shepard, I, I thought what really did Barbara Walters wrong there, talking about how, the way she said it. It's... N-I-G-G-E-R-H-E-A-D in this case, okay? It's not with an A. She said it the way it's said. Yeah. It, Barbara Walters isn't saying it's awesome that it's called niggerhead. She's saying it is called niggerhead. There, there's no other way to pronounce that. And I, I think Sherry Shepard doesn't know what she's talking about, honestly. All right, uh, rest of the Supreme Court, go. Well, yeah, I'm totally with you in the sense of like, yeah, she, she probably shouldn't have said anything. Like, it's. I think Steve said it that she should have just kept that to herself. <laughs> yeah, Sherry sure, Shepard. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, she only did herself an, an injustice. And really, the thing is, is it um, it kind of shows how she's you know you completely missed the point. And when I was saying earlier, when you let a word have so much control of you, and I'm I'm not I'm not denying that she felt whatever she said she felt, but you let a word she says I just felt this shot go through me, <laughs> really. You, you, so you're letting it beat you like that? Yeah, and especially in a situation where you're not being called that, it's being used in a news story where they're condemning the word. You've got to be able to use your judgment to see when it makes sense and when it doesn't. Right. If you just flat out blank, blanket statements say black people can say it and white people can't ever say it, well, that makes no sense. It, it removes human judgment from the equation, and that's what's politically correct and ridiculous. And Sherry Shepard's thought process on this whole situation puts 
everyone in an awkward place, right? Like, in the beginning of this story, I felt uncomfortable saying the word. Right. Because it, you don't know. There might be people watching who have similar feelings, and you don't want to offend, even though it's in the context of the news story. But you know what? From this point forward, it's, if it's in the context of a news story, it's okay. You want to tell people exactly what was said and how it was said. Right. From this point forward, <laughs> so, TYT has decided. So from now on. I'm okay. not going to say N-word anymore when it's in the context of the story. Right. Now, at, at the same time, don't get, like, people get, like, giddy about using the word sometimes. They're like, oh, am I allowed to use it now? Am I allowed? No, there's nothing no, no, to get no, giddy no, about. I don't, mean, I don't mean us. I'm just giving you a heads up. Don't go around, like, like thinking, oh, it's covered. I'm okay. Mm -hmm. TYT said going for forward in news context, I can say it. <laughs> And so, just dropping it left and right. Use some common sense. Right. Okay. I love how we think that people are actually going to listen and be like, okay, well, I, this is what TYT said I could use it and when I couldn't use it. Anyway, all right, we move forward. All right, beginning November 1st, Starbucks will donate uh, money to small businesses in order to create new jobs, to create new businesses. The way Starbucks is planning on doing this is they plan on collecting $5 donations from its customers. Then 100% of the proceeds will go to small businesses that they decide would create jobs within six months. Uh, well, I love it. Look, I, I don't know if it's going to be the uh, world's most effective program, but at least they're trying, right? And and I'd love to see if it is effective. Maybe it might totally work, right? Uh, and nobody else is trying, right? Like we gave like trillions to the banks in nearly free money with almost no interest rate, which they made billions off of, and with no strings attached. They didn't have to create any jobs for small businesses. They didn't have to lend out any money. That was a, such an inane way of doing it, and the Republicans did it and the Democrats did it. So here's Starbucks, a private company, said, let's try to do it the right way. Well, all right, then God bless your heart. And look, the owner of Starbucks also talked about how money is buying our politicians. Howard Schultz, yes, yes. the CEO. Yeah, and so, uh, you know, God, God speed to him. He, he gets what part of the problem. He's trying to address some of the unemployment issues. You know, a lot of people might say, oh, they're just doing it for good PR. And? Okay, great. If you do good things for good PR, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I agree. And Howard Schultz is an interesting cat. As you mentioned, he did uh, speak out against like the polarization in politics, how uh, Democrats and Republicans aren't doing anything for long-term economic success. And, you know, I love that he is trying something new. So I guess we'll see what happens with it. What I'm curious about is what the terms will be, because in this particular Associated Press article, it, it says that it's a loan. Right. So I'm curious to see if it's a loan or if they're actually just giving this money as grants to these small businesses. Well, you know, they probably figure that if it's a loan that they could do more with it. So, you know, you circulate the money and then, and there's nothing wrong with giving loans instead of grants to businesses. In fact, that's probably uh, the more productive way of doing it. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm looking forward to the program and, and I got no dog in that ra race, but, uh, or is it dog in the race or dog in the hunt? Uh, the fight, thank you. And I should try to avoid that, because that's like a Mel Gibson thing. What's well, your dog in this fight? I, I you remember that when yes, you said I that? Do, yeah. I, I, I noticed you don't ask Anna these questions. Why not? You look to us. Anna's oh, right there Oh, because she's 25. Because I'm just like the dumb girl here. <laughs> no, no, no. Because it's like an old school saying, mm -hmm. right? It's like, you know, Chinaman, right? And am I going to be like, hey, Anna, where did Chinaman come from? How would she know? She's 25. I don't know. I figure maybe one of you guys know. It comes from China. See, Steve knows. Well, curious, Dana, did you know the, the term? Because I thought it was because you're a foreigner like he is. No, I, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> i got to keep it real. <laughs> okay, anyway, I don't have a dog in the fight, but, uh, but Starbucks is trying uh, new things, and I like it. And, and just one last thing on it. It shows the emptiness of the government policies, right? And us lives, we're supposed to be in favor of big government. No, we're in favor of effective government, not big government, right? And our government is totally bought, so it never does anything effective because they don't care about small businesses. They care about big businesses that pay their bills. At least someone cares. All right, forward. Demos recently did a study into internet literacy and whether or not the youth in England can accurately determine what is a reliable source on the internet and what is an unreliable source on the internet. What they found was discouraging information. It turns out that the majority of young kids that they studied would read conspiracy theories online and they would consider them accurate. For instance, when they were asked what sources are the most reliable, uh, up on top of that list was YouTube. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I totally agree with that. Well, if you saw it on YouTube, then it's definitely true. Well, I watched Zeitgeist on YouTube, which which might have a few <laughs> accuracies in it, but you, you see what I'm saying, right? Right. No, no. All right, fine. T 
TYT on YouTube. Totally accurate. Everything else. Uh. But here's the difficult thing. Um, you know, you have the internet, which in a way rewrites history because mm -hmm. you have all of these different people, whether it's them sharing conspiracy theories or them just writing inaccurate art, news articles, it doesn't matter. People take those articles, they'll read them, and they'll take them for the truth, right? So th they have this skewed image of what really happened in history, what's really happening right now in current events. And it's particularly hard for kids because they don't know whether or not something is reliable or unreliable. So anyway, uh, they also found out that uh, they start reading about 9-11 conspiracy theories. Uh, they start watching videos on whether or not Osama bin Laden was really killed. And of course, a lot of these kids think the wrong thing. They believe in the conspiracy theories. Right. Well, you know, look, uh, it's, it's interesting because we have a, the human mind, for whatever reason, believes if it's in the media somewhere, and probably for good reason in the old days, that it must be more reliable. This, it's funny, because I think over the weekend, I don't remember who, but somebody said, oh, I read that in a book, so it must be true. <laughs> okay, and of course, it's an absurd thing to say, right? And Or Michelle Bachman, she hears something on the radio, or she gets an email, and she thinks, I got an email, so that's it, it must be true, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we view that as so much more reliable than our friend just telling us. Something, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. But here's the fascinating thing about that. Last week, uh, Ben and I did a story about local news and what source people think is most reliable when it comes to obtaining local news. Coming in at number one was television, but coming in at number two was word of mouth. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting. Hmm. Like they're, they're I'm surprised by that. Yeah, that was probably one of the most fascinating media-related stories I've read. But um, Look, in the old days, it made some degree of sense because if you put something in a book and it wasn't right, you get sued, right? Uh, these days, uh, yeah. <laughs> are you worried? You're going to sue the whole, you know, everything that's inaccurate online? Good luck, man. Gra grab a lawyer, go to work, mm -hmm. right? which they do often. Right? They, but usually they just, instead of going after the real source, they just sue Google as a... Like, I don't know, it's on the internet, I'm going to sue Google. I'm going to sue Google. By the way, <laughs> right. speaking of Google, one of the uh, students that was interviewed for this study said the following. I was searching on Google, I just believe the first answer that came up. To be honest, I know I shouldn't do it, but Google's like a trusted website. It's a lot of people's homepage, and you just automatically put trust in it. Yeah, Faye, don't do that. Disaster. <laughs> okay, Not, nothing against Google, but... Uh, it just searches for other websites. Right. <laughs> okay, like... That's what drives me crazy. Like they think Google's like an entity, like it's the one giving you the information. It's just a search engine. They didn't write those websites. Okay. Internets. Anyway. I was just yeah. about to say that. I yeah. love that you play that sound clip. Right. Okay. Forward. Okay. All right. Uh, two years ago, David uh, Kratz was fired from Bay Systems, and that's basically a defense company. They put together uh, high-tech uh, machinery for wars. And uh, awesome. Yeah, <laughs> sounds like a great company to work for. Win. <laughs> but anyway, um, it turns out that two years ago he was fired because he uh, was obese, and he says that he was fired uh, because of the discrimination. He Fail. shouldn't have been fired. He was originally hired at 450 pounds, so he was obviously a large gentleman when he was originally hired, but throughout his employment with the company, he had gained an additional 200 pounds. Jeez, um, Lord mercy, man. Okay, so he okay. was uh, well over 600 pounds, and, uh, you know, the company decided he was too overweight to work for them, and they decided to fire him. Okay. Right. Now he is suing for discrimination. Uh, since he was fired, he lost 300 pounds. He got a gastric bypass surgery, dieted, uh, did the exercise, and he has lost the weight. But he's saying, look, I shouldn't have been fired. I was with the company for more than 10 years, and um, I've lost the weight now. Maybe they should rehire me. I don't know what's going to end up happening, but what I want to ask you guys is whether or not they should have fired him. And he, keep in mind, he had a desk job. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he wasn't operating heavy machinery or anything like that. <laughs> like, by the way, like, <laughs> why would it hurt to die? Wait, if he's hot, why? He, oh, watch out. That dude's drunk and that dude's fat. Don't let either one of them operate heavy machinery. No, you see what I'm saying? I can <laughs> no, understand I, look, why. Look, look, if, if he couldn't fit somewhere, I mean, I don't, I don't mean to be crass, but literally, right? Then you know, that maybe that, for the purpose of his work, that might be an issue, right? But in this case, if it's a desk job, that's not an issue. Right. Yes. So should they have fired him? Of course not. Yeah, I agree. I don't think they should have fired him. They obviously hired him when he was already overweight, right? If, if you're seriously concerned about his health, do you think it's out of line for the employers to kind of pull him aside and say, hey, look, we're concerned about you. You know, we, we don't want you to get hurt on the job. So, you know, do you, do you want to talk about yeah, health I mean, options maybe? 
I mean, sure, whatever. That's, you know, but firing him is a whole different animal. And of course you shouldn't fire him. Uh, Steve-O, you would fire him, right? <laughs> yeah. He's out of there. He's out of there. I knew it. Really? <laughs> no, of course he wouldn't fire him, but he would be tempted. Uh, <laughs> am I throwing you under the bus? Thank you. <laughs> You're close to firing me. <laughs> Audio power uh, guy has huge power in the company. Uh, okay. Uh, anyway, all right, what's next? Uh, Denmark is the first country that has introduced a fat tax. They're basically going to make people pay a higher amount of money for foods that are high in saturated fat. So butter, milk, cheese, pizza, uh, meat, oil, all of those things that have high saturated fat will be taxed. And the way the tax will work is uh, they will use a tax rate that will correspond with the percentage of saturated fat in the food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, obviously I'm a yes because I'd pay that tax <laughs> if I lived in Denmark. Um, look, the real reason I'm against it is because it's it's overregulating. They, you know, here in the United States we way underregulate. They're like, ah, you want to pollute the environment, leak some benzene, have at it, Hoss, right? Uh, it said I'm going to give you a million examples, right? Uh, but there is such a thing as overregulation and. Like, okay, you tax the cigarettes because they're harmful, then alcohol because it's harmful, not saturated fats because it's harmful. Soon you're going to find out everything is harmful because at some point we all die. So. Everything is harmful. Like, the first thing that came, comes to mind is aspartame, which is in Diet Coke, right? Mm -hmm. Is there going to be an aspartame tax? You know, there's so many unhealthy things like salt, sugar, um, too many carbs. Like, it, okay, what are you going to do about that? Are you going to tax every single thing we eat? I know, Unless they it's are. fresh pro produce? No, yeah. you can't do that. They, and, eventually, they're going to like broccoli, celery, everything else is extra tax. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. and, and when it comes to obesity, there's so many factors at play. It's not just one thing. It's not not just saturated fat, it has to do with portion control. You know what? They should tax my parents. Uh -huh. They're the ones who gave me these genes. So they're like, you know what? You created a child who's overweight. I'm a tax your ass. Okay, now this it's going too far, all right? You libs of Europe, in a lot of ways, us libs in America look up to you and think, oh my God, they have health care coverage. <laughs> You've done a lot of right things. I don't think this is among them. Maybe I think it's time to bring it back. Maybe there's a loophole in the tax system where, you know, if you have a gym membership, Loophole. Half of the tax. Come on. Come on. Yeah, I look, see, that's why, in all seriousness, though, it, that, that's why I'm against all this. Because then you get way too much. Okay, but if you do the tax, and then that's in the tax code, if you go to the gym. But then the gyms have an unnatural advantage. You know what I'm saying? Then the bike uh, companies will say, well, what if you're biking to work? Isn't that great? Shouldn't we get a tax cut, right? And then the kayak companies, are, oh, come on, you're doing rowing, you're going to be in super shape. We should get a tax cut. And the next thing you know, it's crazy. No, I'm totally against it. Sorry. Um, all right, time for a conspiracy theory. Oh, God. That you will hear online because you'll hear it here and you shouldn't necessarily believe. <laughs> uh, you mentioned aspartame? Yes. Uh, I stopped drinking Diet Coke because of you guys. Uh, a bunch of you sent me emails showing that the company that uh, produced aspartame or uh, manufactured it or whatever, sold it, uh, was run by Don Rumsfeld when it got approved by the... Um, Food and Drug Administration. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh boy. <laughs> right. And here's my crazy conspiracy theory on this. I think that Coke started Coke Zero because they know at some point Diet Coke is going under. You think so? I doubt it. Okay. I doubt it. Because Coke Zero and Diet Coke, I never understood. Wait, one's one calorie, the other one's zero calories. And? <laughs> okay. Now I know they taste a little different, etc. But it seemed to me like, and I thought it from the beginning, before I even get the aspartame, the rum etc., I thought, it seems like they're making preparations to replace Diet Coke with Coke Zero. I wonder why. Then I read the aspartame, Don Rumsfeld, stuff like that. And at some point, they, you know, we could find out, oh yeah, aspartame is uh, really bad for you. They're like, oh, don't worry about it. Just drink Coke Zero. See, we're that ready. That could happen. That, Do you that see could what I'm happen. saying? But there are people out there like me who know the truth, who know that aspartame is bad for you, but I still prefer Diet Coke over Coke Zero. That's because you got hooked on it. You got to get unhooked on oh, it. Oh, it's so delicious, though. <laughs> It no, is. no, it's the funny, I, okay, last thing, last thing. So, Coke I love, right, uh, ironic or not, whatever it is, right? And then I switched to Diet Coke cause, uh, because da, 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 I didn't want to get taxed. Uh, <laughs> and then you get hooked on Diet Coke, like your taste buds change. Then Coke tastes bad to you and Diet Coke tastes bad. Yes. Yes! <laughs> but I'm here to tell you, you can undo that. 
Like I know. I, here's here's what I do. I mostly drink water once, twice, maybe three times a week, but usually once or twice. I'll have a diet coke, right? Because it just I like the way it tastes. But I'm not a regular soda drinker, so it doesn't really affect me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and and I would never drink a regular can of coke. Too much sugar, too many calories. Not worth it. I hear you. All right. God bless your heart. Forward. All right. Uh, a teacher from Vacaville, California, interesting place, interesting town in California, punishes his students for saying bless you after his students sneeze. Okay. We have a local news report on this. And then I actually want to have a discussion with JR because JR is going to love this teacher. Let's watch. You know, we're Catholic, we're supposed to say what well, we, you know, our religion. It's respectful to say bless you. But health teacher Steve Kukovich believes it's more disrespectful to say bless you in his class, even disruptive to the point that he's knocked off 25 points from a student's grade for saying it. Man, you're going to lose points if you say bless you in the classroom. Man, you lose points if you say bless you in It's not a, uh, got anything to do with religion. It's got to do with an interruption of class time. I think that's ridiculous, you know. First the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, now, you know, preventing a kid from saying bless you. It's Kukovich reiterates his discipline has nothing to do with religion. This is how he explains it. The blessing doesn't really make any sense anymore. When you sneeze, in the old days, they thought you were dispelling evil spirits out of your body. So they were saying, God bless you for getting rid of the evil spirits. But today I said, really what you're doing is doesn't make any sense anymore. Everybody has the right to their own beliefs, uh, but they don't have rights to impose those beliefs on other people, and especially not school children. Kukovich says he won't hesitate to discipline his students, just not that way anymore. Principal Cliff DeGraw agrees. He realizes there's other better ways to do that, and we don't condone you know, that type of, 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 of punishment. All right, I am inexcusably male. <laughs> because as we're watching that story, I kept looking at the profile of the reporter. They took a fascinating camera shot, and I got distracted. Uh, sorry, I'm a child. Now we move forward. Okay, <laughs> uh, obviously he's wrong. I mean, like, on the substance, he's right. It, it, that is why they used to say, bless you. And I don't believe that our spirit, our evil spirits or whatever are escaping, uh, et cetera. But it's just simple politeness, and he's blowing it out of pr proportion. And second of all, it's not that it's disrupting the class. It's that since he knows that, he doesn't like it. You right. know what it I'm saying? It gets on his nerve. It so gets on his nerve because he doesn't believe it, and, uh, et cetera. And just let the kids say it. It takes two seconds. It takes much longer to debate this whole goddamn thing. Yeah, there's an actual <laughs> local news story on it. It's ridiculous. Yeah. But uh, JR and I actually had this long discussion about whether or not we should say bless you at work. And mm -hmm. for a while, I stopped saying bless you because he told me that story uh -huh. about what bless you is really about. But then I decided I like saying bless you to people after they sneeze. So no, I, I brought that just, habit back. Just for no reason. Just for absolutely no reason. And it's understandable as it's long as you know. Nice. And I think after, after I told you that and then you stop for a minute, and then you start again, as long as you, you know, you can do whatever you want. As long as you know what the background is. You yes. know what you're saying. You know, that's all. Yeah. No, I fully concede that it's perfectly irrational, right? But it, there is something uh, nice about exchanging pleasantries uh, and being polite to one another throughout the day. Right. It and it gives you an tone. excuse to do it. In fact, my favorite is when I do it in public to other people. And they're like, oh, thank you. Yeah, see, that's right? what, yeah. yeah. But I mean, coming from people who don't believe in God, it's just the, it's the most backwards, ass backwards thing yeah. I've ever seen. So, the, okay, so this is our thing. This, this is what, I've, this is what I've, I've been trying to implement this. So, uh, when you burp, I should say, bless you. You got that gas bubble out of your chest, out of your stomach. Don't you feel better? Bless you. Don't you feel no, better? No, but you see, and if you sneeze, you should tell me, excuse me, because you're sneezing your germs and your shit all over me. Here's why that doesn't uh, excuse work. Excuse me? You just sneezed on me, bitch. <laughs> no, no. Here's why that doesn't work. Because then you're pointing out something um, gross yeah. that the guy did, right? And so every, everybody, he just burped. <laughs> Bless you. And instead of being polite, it becomes a dick move. Or someone toots. <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> oh, Jesus and Lord mercy. <laughs> okay, now Bring we're more attention to it. Yeah. Why isn't sneezing embarrassing? You're sneezing all over the place. Sometimes you, if you're sick, there's a snot ball that comes out of your nose. That's nasty. Excuse me. Do not sneeze at me. Okay, JR. Bless you, don't you feel better that burp was excellent? No, but excellent. with sneezing, you can't really control yourself. With burping and farting, you can. Except in this work environment, I sometimes I question that. No, no, no. It's, uh, people who get annoyed at other people sneezing are uh, called Larry David. It's unacceptable, okay? <laughs> the only exception is when someone sneezes like 28 times in a row. Dude, take it elsewhere. 
Okay, like there's a bounds of reason to it. I'm just keeping it real. Okay. Yes. By the way, the Turks have the most logical bless you equivalent, and of course, mo I don't know if it's most, but certainly many cultures have an equivalent, right? They say chokyasha, okay, mm -hmm. which doesn't refer to Allah or God or Buddha at all. It just means live long. Okay. Armenians have something ser uh, similar. That's uh, because they copied us. Right. Except, no, we didn't. <laughs> Just calm the hell down. <laughs> Ours is Arochtutun. That means, yeah, actually, that means bless you. Never mind. Yeah. Right. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Or uh, health. It means like health. When, when I was learning Spanish, it's salud. Uh, was it Kazuntite? Was it Germans? All that kind I'm not sure the German ones, but you tell me later, Jake. Yeah, um, it's Kartoffels. <laughs> <laughs> it all comes back to, oh, good health. Oh, my God, aren't you going to die? Oh, God. Oh, it was back in the, in the dark ages when everyone died of a cold. And it's That's why they did it. That's right. And then they, they called it evil spirits because they didn't know any better. <laughs> right? Uh, uh, yes. Well, I, I want to defend the teacher because it just took me back to my high school obnoxious student days where I know he's doing it because, you know, high school kids, are, not one kid's going to say it, 12 kids are going to say, bless you. And that's when it becomes a distraction. Because I remember when I was in high school, we used to say prayer since I went to Catholic school. We used to say prayer every morning in every class. So while the professor starts a prayer, then he opens it up to the classroom. Is, does anybody want to pray for somebody? And then, like, half the class had somebody to, for, to pray for, oh, somebody nice. else's mom to pray for, so it just took up about half the class. So it was no, no. obnoxious, so I kind of see I know, but that's them. different. I mean, a bless you is different than, all right, let me tell you about my carpenter. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, Although like, that I might make sense, because if you got could, a Jewish carpenter. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I could see where the- guy started the whole thing, but anyway. But I could see where the professor's coming, where it becomes uh, obnoxious. So. No, no. I, I get I, he's a big grumpy, but I also see uh, where he's coming. Okay, look, look. I hear that. Let me say. Well, let me add one thing. Apparently, this is the biggest story of the day. <laughs> yes, okay, yes. let me add one thing. Because here's how my dad would have handled this, right? Whether he thought that or the teacher made sense or didn't make sense, if he deducted 25 points for my score uh, for not listening to him when uh, and continuing to say bless you, he would have doubled down. Mm -hmm. Okay, he'd have been like, "That's absolutely right. Now you shut up and you listen to your teacher." Okay, and if you don't, there's more punishment coming your way. That is hilarious. Okay, you know why? Because you got to respect the teacher. So you don't like his plan? Here's a tall glass of shut up juice. I don't give a damn that you don't like his plan. He's the teacher. Okay, I once defied my, a teacher. Oh, the Dogen was not happy about that, and uh, and 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 had a way of showing it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got to do one more video, okay, before we end the hour. So let's get yes. to that. Yes, uh, and oh, one other thing. <laughs> See, it's disrupting the whole show. You're the teacher was right. You were right. Okay. Anyway, people always get confused when I say God bless. I don't know why that's one of my favorite things. Mm -hmm. But like when something good happens, I'm like God bless. You know, like oh, I'm gonna go out for a run. God bless. Okay. And and then, but the funny thing is, religious people will think I'm one of them. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get a lot of like, oh, yeah, see you at church. <laughs> they don't actually say that, but that's the look they give me. And I think, oh, little do you know. Okay, anyway, forward. All right, a Turkish boy at a jewelry shop stopped a robbery in progress. I thought of course this, he did, he's Turkish. I can't believe that. How many of these stories have we done where Turkish individuals, like, stop some sort of robbery? Yeah, here's who you don't want to do a robbery around, Turks. Okay, so this, this is at a jewelry store in Istanbul. Uh, I want to show you guys the video, and then we'll discuss it. Keep an eye on the 12-year-old. Uh, Damn! <laughs> that is a brave 12-year-old. Especially since he's holding a gun. I, I that was awesome. Cover. He's like, oh, you want to point a gun at me? That's how you want to roll? I don't think so. Karate chop! <laughs> <laughs> okay. And he said to dude, really? Yes. I mean, the guy went, huasikt it, probably, literally. <laughs> Okay. Like stumbled out the door. Yeah, he stumbled out the door, and then the kid slams the door behind him. Don't come back. Okay. And then the guy, like, if you saw in the other part of the video, he like 
kind of tried the door and then he's like, oh, screw it, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> and he just ran away. That was great. I love that. That's it. Just want to show you guys that video. <laughs> okay. Turks, man, they ain't nothing to mess with. <laughs> we, they teach that stuff from when you were a little kid. Watch this, watch this. Oh, he's being cool, he's being casual. He's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna rob this place. I think he was trying to grab the kid, though. Right, yeah. And the kid's like, you're not gonna grab me. I'm gonna grab you. <laughs> watch this. Washington! <laughs> what is amazing is how, watch, you see he tries to get back in, he's like, ah, screw it, and runs away. Okay, what's amazing is how unfazed Turks are by guns. Like, dude, it's a gun, you can get hurt, cut it out. I don't know. By the way, the robber was eventually caught by the police, so he's sitting in jail, thanks to the 12 year old. That's how we roll, man. I'm already teaching pro karate chops. <laughs> All right, listen, we're out of time. Here's the situation. Um, well, I'm going to talk to Robert Greenwald next. Uh, of course, he's with Brave New Films. They've been tracking the Koch brothers. Apparently, there's the Koch brothers show. Mm -hmm. And they want to talk to you about different sins of the Koch brothers that wasn't even covered in that legendary encyclopedic uh, uh, article by Bloomberg. So let's come back and do that. Also fun for everybody.